Ladies and gentlemen, we're waiting for others to join. The webinar will be starting in about two minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be starting with the program in about one minute. Good evening. It's, I'm Mike Perham, the Executive Director of the Army Heritage Center Foundation, and I, I welcome you to tonight's webinar. Uh, it's gotten warm back up here in central Pennsylvania, so we've moved from outside the building into the World War II barracks because it's a comfortable uh, place to be tonight. Uh, tonight, I'm pleased to uh, have Leon Reed uh, join us. Uh, Leon worked on defense preparedness and energy policy as a Senate aide, as a defense consultant, and as a teacher of United States history. He lives in Gettysburg, where he volunteers at the Gettysburg National Military Park Visitor Center and writes military history. He is a frequent contributor to Civil War News and has written four books on the Civil War. Tonight's presentation is at a different time period. Uh, this is a book he co-authored with his wife, uh, Lois Lembeau, on the World War II experiences of her father, Frank Lembeau, and the combat record of the 80th Division, specifically focusing on some of the combat engineer units uh, within that division. So. I, I welcome you tonight. Leon, the floor is yours. Okay, let me share my screen. Whoa, not. Uh, I'll have to back up a little bit. There. Okay, thank you. Um, tonight I'm going to talk about. Um, a project uh, concerning my father-in-law, who is shown there on the cover of the book, Frank Lembo. Um, I'm the front man, sort of, the speaker about it, but I was a minority partner in preparing the book. This, this was a 
a labor of love for my wife for a decade. Um, it started out, uh, Frank, uh, at the end of the war confiscated, um, the term they used was promoted, uh, the manuscript of the company diary. And at first, um, she prepared a manuscript basically in this list, focusing on the second item, what the engineers were doing. The diary listed day by day where they were and some information about the tasks they performed. And she supplemented that with uh, information from the 80th Division website, which is one of the most phenomenal resources on the internet. Um, it was always known that her dad had saved the letters that he wrote his fiance, but while he was alive, they were in the category of, I don't feel like digging them out right now, I'll do it later. I think he had decided that people were free to read him after he was gone. Um, so after the long preparation of a manuscript about the engineers, it then became, once the letters became available, a manuscript about the engineers and Frank's personal experience. Uh, when it became a book project, we also added into that what the infantry, what the war, what the 80th division was doing. So the book I'm talking about is a little bit of combat memoir, uh, a little bit an engineer's activity and a little bit of divisional history. Uh, I hope it all ties together. Um, the main characters, uh, Frank Lembo and Betty Craig, uh, Frank's fiance, um, they had been uh, off and on since high school. Uh, Frank was very sure they were made for each other. Betty wasn't quite as sure. Uh, they did get engaged while Frank was home on leave from training. Uh, Frank frequently said uh, he was sorry they hadn't gotten hitched. Um, there are no letters from Betty in this correspondence. He had to burn her letters. Uh, her personality shines brightly through though in Frank's reactions to her comments. Um, we have a record, he wrote fi over 500 letters to her while he was in the army. This book focuses on, uh, it starts when he got on the Queen Mary to deploy to Europe and ends when he came home. That segment of his experience, there's 86 letters. Other important characters are the boys. Uh, Frank was a sergeant in an engineering battalion, a squad leader, and this is a bunch of his squad. Um, the fun thing about research, um, we had seen this letter about the painting mood and the, the truck called Lem's Junk, and we were certainly aware of that. And totally disconnected from that, we had this photo, which God knows who these people are. They must have been people Frank knew, but who knows. One night I'm looking at it and I notice there's writing on that truck in the background and I look more closely and it's Lem's junk. Um, the truck that the boys were in a painting mood and fixed up. This is an important, I, I, this, this photo is an important reminder to us. Uh, we talk about the greatest generation. When I became aware of them, you know, when I was like a 10 year old, very impressionable kid, you know, these were the 40 year old men who my dad's friends, you know, we went on trailering trips with them and they ran the church and my enduring image of the greatest generation is 40 year old men. Um, it's important to remember, I mean, this, this picture without the uniforms, this could be a youth soccer team. You know, we sent kids to save the world over to Europe. It's a trite observation, but it's worth keeping in mind. Uh, just a review, uh, what the tasks the engineers performed 
basically, a mechanized army doesn't move without engineers. That was actually true in the Civil War as well, but even more true in World War II. Uh, the 305th engineers that Frank served in were called, they were divisional engineers. Um, they typically, they were within the infantry division and they typically operated in direct support of infantry battalions. Uh, they did the combat crossings, both the salt boats and putting in the expedient bridges. Um, there were also core level engineers who who did the road work behind lines and came in after the army had moved on and put in the more permanent bridges. I did a very unscientific survey, just ticking each thing mentioned in the company diary and the five most commonly mentioned tasks for B Company of the 305th Engineers, which was Frank's outfit. First, clearing mines permanent job every day, every mile. Also booby traps, abatis, other obstacles. Second was building roads, uh, repairing, clearing snow, clearing wrecked abandoned equipment, burying dead animals. Third, reconnaissance of riverbanks, etc. This was often behind enemy lines. Engineers are known as bridge builders, but you know, sort of a snarky comment. Uh, you only build a bridge when you get to a river. You're clearing mines every mile you're going. So bridge building was a more infrequent task. And finally, fighting as infantry. They had many other jobs they did, uh, ferrying troops across rivers, laying mines, destroying bridges, uh, the headquarter and service company had an important, um, uh, sorry, headquarter and service platoon of maintaining water supply. And when they were in cities, often they were the constabulary to maintain law and order. Uh, so uh, the 80th division was the Blue Ridge division. In World War I, it was indeed mainly drawn from Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia. Uh, the uh, staffing of army divisions in World War II was a little more, you know, you, you wound up with the soldiers you wound up with. So the geographical uh, nexus wasn't as clear. The chain of command, uh, obviously uh, General Patton, Third Army and his very dear friend, uh, Sir Bernard Law Montgomery, um, starting from the bottom up, uh, Horace McBride was the commander of the 80th Division through a good bit of training and all but the last few weeks of the war. Manton Eddy, uh, most of the war they were in 12th Corps. Manton Eddy was the commander of the 12th Corps. This picture, uh, this is Wade Hazlip of the 15th Corps. This picture was taken December 15th, 1944 there in the midst of creating the most short life plans ever since the next morning, uh, the Germans launched their assault on the Ardennes and any plans the two of them came up with at this dinner were quickly out the window. Uh, one level up from, uh, he was the immediate subordinate to Patton, one level up from Patton, Omar Bradley, and of course, Ike, uh, the, the Shafe commander. This photo was taken in Bestung. Uh, this is the itinerary of the 80th Division. Uh, they came ashore at Utah Beach about um, six weeks after D-Day. Third Army was activated, as probably most of you know, when uh, Operation Cobra started the breakout from Normandy. Uh, across France, Lorraine, the race up to Luxembourg for the bulge and then the spring campaign. Um, we'll talk about these things. When the Argentan uh, Falaise pocket collapsed, this is one week of progress for Third Army. 
They made about 600 miles. Um, they hit the Moselle River here, immediately across the Moselle River, partly because of fuel shortages, partly because of stiffening German resistance. This represents three months of Third Army's life, certainly the most frustrating time of Patton's career. Argentan, uh, the baptism of fire. Uh, the first time Patton got a stand down order, he decided why bother with this city, just go capture Germans. He was gonna gallop north and was ordered by Bradley, do not go north of Argentan. He had reasons for it, you know, uh, running into friendly fire and that sort of thing. Uh, Argentan was liberated August 20th. These two photos taken in front of the same building, uh, soldiers from the 317th and from the 318th. Um, it is sad to think uh, the casualty rates among infantry being what they were, it's likely of the 25 or so soldiers we see in these pictures. You know, if 10 of them survived the war, that would be above the odds. Um, there was always a first flag ceremony. The first village or town you liberate, you know, was a special occasion and you had a little ceremony. This was the 80th division's first flag ceremony. The chase, um, literally a romp for Third Army. Uh, 305th Battalion did in a single day, 330 miles. This is in convoy on dirt roads. It's hard, to, it was a very long day, obviously. At this point, many people, this is um, mid-August 1944, many people, high command and the home front, are pretty well convinced the Germans are done and the war is all but over. Uh, most of the river crossings at this, this stretch were uncontested, uh, but unfortunately the army outran their supplies. This shows General Patton crossing the Seine River, standing in a Jeep. This is General Eddy interacting with some French teenagers in a recently liberated village. Whoop. Uh, this was one of Frank's comments. March to Berlin is good moments. The French are happy. Keep throwing wine and eggs at us. The other day we got 160 eggs. Nice. Made, came in handy for breakfast. This is an army. This is not the 80th division. It's a Signal Corps photo of some GIs enjoying breakfast. This was a time every GI remembered fondly is. This war is fun. Uh, we're making miles and the Germans are just about finished. Um, this shows, this is a photo by Frank, uh, some of the boys from the 305th celebrating with villagers. Um, as that photo reminds us, these were teenagers and young men, most of them away from home for the first time. And the, 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 at this point, the horrors of war haven't really hit them. Last night we had a rodeo here, lassoing the cattle. War was completely forgotten. This is August. Uh, the comforts of life are an ever present thought, you know, Inside living is better than living in tents. Finding a hog and slaughtering it and having ham and sausage and tenderloin is better than eating, you know, army food in the mood for fish and went down and dropped the engineers. One nice thing about being an engineer is you have access to as much TNT as you want. Threw a couple blocks in the river and got all the fish we needed. Large minefield, this, this came up repeatedly. We, you know, liberated 500 mines, put them in a big pile and blew them up and man, was that fun. Um, 
their first serious combat was the Moselle River. Uh, this is the end of the chase. Uh, this is the first time Patton has his fuel taken away. Uh, this one is on, this is the, uh, the one shown in the movie. Uh, the supplies are diverted to Montgomery for Operation Market Garden. Third Army comes to a halt for, for a, a few days uh, at the verge of the Moselle. Uh, unbeknownst to them, the Germans have uh, transferred a few divisions from Italy and resupplied substantially. Their divisions on the far side of the Moselle are still just a shadow of what was there in Normandy two months ago. But now they are real fighting forces and they're, they're not as demoralized as we thought. They, they're prepared to put up a stiff fight. When Patton gets his fuel back, he says, go, go, go. Don't take time to reconnoiter. There's no Germans over there. We can still be in Berlin in 10 days, just go. The first attempt, um, September 5th, um, 317th Regiment bore the brunt of it and got absolutely plastered. Um, a week later, September 12th, they moved a little further south to Dillard, more methodical crossing. They did some reconnaissance, they did some uh, pre-assault softening up with both the Air Corps and the artillery. Uh, both days though, the, the um, resistance was intense and the German defense in the hills just beyond the river was, was savage. Uh, typically, um, the first crossings of a river are in assault boats. Uh, three engineers and 14 soldiers, uh, the engineers paddle, bring the boats back for the next group, while simultaneously, usually other engineers are trying to get bridges in. Usually the first bridges will be a footbridge just to get infantry across with dry feet. Um, if possible, they're also trying to get um, expedient vehicle bridges. These would typically be a Bailey bridge, which is a sort of a, a modular uh, bridge or a treadway, which is on pontoons with two treads for tanks. Um, if you can't get the bridges in, there were numbers of times where the infantry was across the river for a day or two without any armored or artillery direct support, and that was tough. Um, the Corps engineers would come along and put in more permanent bridges. The major assault crossings the 80th did over the course of the war were shown here. Um, Moselle Cell, Need Francaise, Need Allemande are all in Lorraine. The Sauer was uh, leaving Luxembourg after they had gone north for the bulge crossing from Luxembourg into Germany. The Inn was um, crossing from uh, Germany into Austria uh, the last week or two of the war. There were other bridge crossings, but those were the major ones that were contested. Um, the Moselle, this, we enjoyed this. This is my wife. This is uh, 10 years ago. Uh, we did a Frank Lambeau tour of France and Luxembourg and Belgium. And we were very amused when we found this right at the crossing point in Dillard. Uh, the bridge was destroyed in September 1944, too bad for the Allies, obviously by the Germans, and was rebuilt in uh, August 1953. Obviously the 80th Division would have been very happy if that bridge had still been there. Um, at Dillard, they had to first cross a canal, then an open floodplain, then the main channel, two branches of the river with a large bear island in between. This was a tough crossing. The engineers, of course, were simultaneously ferrying troops and separate platoons putting in the bridges. 
uh, Frank wrote. Frank didn't often write about the horrors of war, but he would describe, give matter of fact description. We're 10 at night, 10 in the morning in a valley. Uh, on Germans on one side, on the opposite hill on our side was all you could wish for. This is about a thousand yard long line of artillery and machine guns. Everything we had opened up and the light was something I'd never, or almost a thousand yards wide line machine guns laid down fire, turned everything to a red glare. Uh, of course, the infantry is waiting. The engineers walked across the open field carrying equipment. Morning came, the assault was over, a complete success. Um, they didn't all work as easily as that one. And in fact, that one was still a pretty bloody um, accomplishment. But the, and the, the soldiers were advised, um, you're not trying to make the folks at home feel miserable. Um, keep, keep it light. You, you, know, you know how good letters from home make you feel you want the folks at home to feel good when they read your mail. So don't, don't dwell on the downside. Um, immediately upon crossing uh, the Moselle, uh, they got into the Lorraine campaign. Um, and within a few weeks, the, uh, because of the Patton movie, uh, the fuel shortage on the verge of the Moselle is the one that most people are aware of. The fuel shortage a month later is the real shortage. Uh, Third Army was basically at a stop for about six weeks. Um, this was, uh, the diversion now was, uh, we have to clear the port of Antwerp um, to get fuel because we just, we can't bring in supplies from the Normandy beaches and continue to supply the army anymore. Uh, Third Army was at a pause from about the 25th of September until about the 6th of November, with the exception of one day. That day was one heck of a day. It was the division's bloodiest day of the war. Um, interesting, the perspectives of uh, the sergeant and the general Patton were so depressed. Brad and I are thinking of going to China to serve under Nimitz. Frank, of course, I mean, they obviously are aware they're not winning the war and they're not getting home if they're just at a pause. But on the other hand, uh, there are some bright sides. Yeah, uh, we still living in buildings and today we fix the generator. So now we have lights. Uh, a few of the boys are out butchering a heifer. So we'll be eating steak. Chickens seem to have disappeared from here in the same of hogs. Frank, Frank was very proud of his squad's cooking ability. There's mentions in letters, you know, my baker got transferred out. So I'm going to have to either get a guy who can bake or learn to bake myself. And, you know, we made ice cream. It was really good. Um, they ate well. Um, during the pause, uh, the next step after the pause is over, inevitably is going to be crossing the Cell River. And uh, they're not going anywhere, but uh, they know what their mission's going to be. And the Cell River was probably the best reconnoitered um, uh, uh, operation, maybe in the whole war. They they sent dozens of patrols across the cell to find every machine gun nest, every artillery emplacement, every strong point. Uh, one night, Frank went across and um, ran into an ambush and wound up earning a silver star. You can see his light, uh, you know, went on a mission and had the time of our dumb luck. After the war, I'll tell you about it. Rather humorous. I don't think it was humorous at the time. The army citation in inimitable army boilerplate, you know, Lieutenant Lembo's patrol, forced to withdraw, voluntarily remain, exposed and had his position. Um, just while I was around, my wife 
went at her dad. I mean, her dad did not make a secret of the outlines of his experience. You know, we knew he had a silver star. We knew he had been in Bastogne, um, but he would not talk about details. I watched Lois go at her dad about the Silver Star mission at least five times. And the two answers I heard, one was, ah, it was really nothing. And the other was, I just don't want to talk about it. So we're fortunate we at least have the army citation to give us a bit of an idea. Um, it wasn't all uh, prime rib and, you know, butchering heifers. Um, during October, it begins to sink in. The war is not almost over. Uh, winter chill is setting in. I guess we'll have to be contented. The, the two latter comments are shortly after uh, the division's bloodiest single day of the war. We fight yard by yard and then fight to hold it. Uh, pretty tough the last few days, lost some very good friends. No sense keeping thinking about them. May the dead rest in peace and the wounded get well. The cell crossing, uh, that's a Bailey Bridge, which I had mentioned. It was a modular, um, it could be almost any length. I mean, they could be, that's a single Bailey Bridge module, but they could string two or three of them together and make a pretty considerable bridge. Um, they were very popular. They required, I mean, it was developed by an English engineer to be easy to assemble, required no special tools. So this was something you really could throw together on the fly. Um, again, a sort of a lighthearted description. They shelled us, but later on we returned and got it in. If you could see my truck going to the river, You'd have thought we were going to a picnic, 20 guys hanging on a rubber float, hanging on top and rolling merrily along. Uh, one of the bridges that was put in collapsed into the river and they spent the next day digging it out. Frank didn't swim. So for him, working in a river would have been fun. New engineering mission when they reached St. Evold, uh, a civilian alerted the 319th Regiment that the Germans had left hundreds of time bombs and his credibility was improved when one went off. Um, the 305th got the mission of finding and disarming them. They did find a few um, and a few went off. Uh, the, 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 the 80th Division was happy to, to leave. The plan was to move the headquarters to St. Evold. It was the major town in that sector, the 80th, was very happy to move along. Um, Fairbursviller was a little nasty fight, which happened to be memorialized in Stars and Stripes by Jimmy Cannon, who later went on to be a really well-known sports writer. Uh, Frank sent this home to Betty, sort of a, you think you'd know something about what combat's like. This is what's combat's like. Uh, once the enemy held it, then we came, then they came, now only the dead are there. Um, there is a monument in this village, only the fish in the stream are alive here today. Lorraine was certainly the most frustrating time for Third Army. Patton wrote, sort of a mock letter to the chief of staff. I hope in the final settlement of the war, you insist the Germans retain Lorraine because it's such an obnoxious place. Of course, obviously from the French point of view, obtaining Lorraine and Alsace back is one of the main reasons that the war happened at all. Battle of the Bulge. Um, Mid-December, uh, Third Army has finally fought its way that 50 miles to the edge of Lorraine. They're on the verge of moving into Germany. 80th Division literally has orders on December 16th to begin their assault across the Saar River. 
Uh, this is all interrupted, of course, by the German offensive in the Ardennes. Patton's intelligence staff had actually been warning for a week that they thought something was cooking up there. Uh, Patton originally, when Bradley first uh, said, George, hold up a bit. We're not really sure we want to pitch into Germany right now. At first grumbled, but he very quickly recognized that the bulge was the real show and was 100% committed to that. Um, the Allied High Command recognized we've got the Germans in the open. This is a great opportunity, but only if we can get enough soldiers there to actually blunt the offensive and, you know, roll them back. Um, of course, if you've seen the movie, the famous comment, uh, variously quoted, but some, some permutation of I can attack with three divisions in 72 hours. 80th was one of those divisions. And before that meeting was over, Patton had prepared contingency plans. Um, he had a code word for each of three. During a break in the meeting, he called his staff and gave the code word. And the three divisions were all on the move uh, before that meeting ended. This was a challenge. Um, you've got an army with its supply all set up to move east and now you're moving north uh, on horrible weather, uh, no supplies on roads that nobody has reconnoitered. You don't have maps. Uh, obviously the 305th led the way for the 80th, uh, marking routes, directing traffic, clearing obstacles, etc. cetera. Um, nice quote from a 317th soldier 25 to 30 men in open trucks. We skidded over icy and crowded roads for the entire day and night. Uh, Patton did meet his, uh, he was ready with three divisions in 72 hours to make an attack. Um, a nice quote um, by a captain in the 319th about the World War II fundamentally for the infantrymen was house to house fighting. You know, they tended to motor along between towns and then they got to towns and either the Germans were still holding it or they weren't. Um, quite near the buildings that signal the tanks to stop, poured through holes, members of the wreck and second bragged, if they can get a house on both sides of a the street, they will get that street. Uh, it was a savage, cold-blooded assault fueled by fear and an animal-like excitement. Now, think back about that photo of the boys and Lem's junk. Um, you know, these guys by this point are certainly hardened professional soldiers, but they're just kids. Um, if you read biographies, uh, memoirs by children of veterans. Uh, many of them stress, you know, the challenges of living with a World War II veteran. If dad falls asleep, get out of the room and don't make noise. You know, you do not want to be anywhere near when, if he gets awakened by surprise. Um, you know, the GIs of World War II, they, they, they brought the war home with them. They took great pains to try not to share them with their family. But when you read about this and think about, you know, the Reckon Second might have done this 40 times over the course of the war. Um, you know, it wasn't just uh, riding in trucks and celebrating with the citizens of liberated villages. This was um, an exercise for those people. Um, southern end of the bulge, of course, this is a very familiar story. The 101st was sent from reserve to hold Bestone, uh, plus uh, a combat command of 10th Armored of 3rd Army was sent in and other bits and pieces. 
of artillery and random groups, but as the, you know, a, a finite group of people holding a critical crossroads town, cut off and surrounded by Germans. Uh, Fourth Armored is assigned the task to break through. Um, very tough going. The Germans, they know where the relief is coming from. So they threw everything they had. Uh, the folk in Bastogne were, were very clear in expressing their hope that Fourth Armored would get there. Sorry, I didn't get to shake hands today. I was disappointed. Um, on Christmas Eve, um, General McBride, 80th Division commander, was ordered to attach two battalion, two infantry battalions to Fourth Armored just to give them a little more infantry punch. He selected the first and second battalions of 318th. Second battalion of the 318th was the group that Frank's squad most frequently supported. And Frank's platoon, 42 men, is selected as the engineering complement for these two battalions heading to the relief of Bestone. Um, their job, obviously, scouting, clearing roads and mines, setting up roadblocks, directing traffic, uh, clearing obstacles, etc. cetera. Uh, a brittle slog, this map is a, a hand-drawn map from a 318th um, after action report showing Chamont and the various, you know, each, each company and their separate route, Assinois, the last village before Bastogne. Um, the symbolic link up, uh, Colonel Boat or Lieutenant Bogus and his tanks was late afternoon the 27th. Um, the infantry really opened it up where it really was opened up the morning of the 28th. Uh, they linked up with the defenders. Um, the proud but typical army understatement um, report at exactly 1000, the company commander reported to Colonel Gardner that the mission was complete. The company had reached the outpost line around Bestone. We don't want to show any signs of celebration in a in an army message. They got a brief break in Bestone that afternoon, got to change clothes, uh, had a Christmas dinner. Uh, always look at the bright side. Uh, casualties um, since rations had been drawn for 350 men and there were about 150 left. There was ample food for all. Um, the second battalion and all attached units, including Frank's platoon, earned the presidential unit citation for this mission. Uh, Frank wrote several letters during the campaign. Um, the morning after their long truck ride to get there. I'm rather tired, I didn't get to bed till 5 a.m. and up at 8.30, fighting going on over the next hill, slamming away at each other, jam-packed with things. The battle that was going on Christmas day still going on in increasing fury. Something has to give soon, I doubt it will be us. Now the best, the bulge shook people up, uh, both at the home front, the high command, and the GIs on the front lines. I guess this damn war will never end. And no doubt you people back home got a severe jolt, and indeed they did. Um, if you've seen the movie, you've seen the Christmas prayer, uh, or the weather prayer. Patton sent out a nice little greeting to Third Army Frank, kept it and sent it home. On one side is his Christmas greeting, wishing every officer and soldier a Merry Christmas and expressing my full confidence. On the other side, the weather prayer. Um, one of the nicest pieces of soldier writing I've ever encountered. This is January 2nd, so a few days after he returned to his unit from Bastogne. Uh, it's a new year, so he's obviously in a reflective mood. J 
just thinking about that last day, how perfect it was, how long away I've come since then, boat ride to England, thousand deaths when we heard our first artillery shell, the mad dash across France, storming our first river, Moselle, fighting Christmas in Belgium, New Year. We, yes, we've come a long way. We're a little tired, a little older, and a little bitter. We fight hoping each battle is the last one with thoughts of going home and enjoying a peaceful life. Our thoughts run to our sweethearts who we long for, each letter being a five minute furlough with the one you love. That thought of the five minute furlough is just to me, you know, the most wonderful thought that comes out of this, that all these letters Frank's writing his fiance, you know, it's partly for Betty just to keep her, you know, to let her know that he's thinking of her. But it's for him too, just, you know, I get a five minute break from all this stuff. And for that five minutes, I'm with you. Uh, immediately after the bulge, the sour crossing actually was the toughest assault crossing for the 80th of the whole war. You had the Siegfried line on the far, far shore, plus record high flood levels. Uh, it took a full week, the, 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 the infantry company successfully got across, but it took a full week before the first bridge was put in because of the high water. So the infantry fought with no artillery or armor on their bank of the river. And you, you read about the two places you most frequently read about that I've seen at least. One is Omaha Beach, getting off Omaha Beach. The second in the Civil War is getting up Missionary Ridge where it just was sort of a, there was no command. It was just kind of a simultaneous division by the soldiers that, decision, I'm sorry, that if we don't get out of here, we're gonna die here, so let's go. Uh, many of these isolated companies that are all alone across the river just said, you know, there's those, you know, Siegfried line pillboxes up at the top of the hill and they're going to beat us to death unless we go do something about it. So let's go do something about it. And they just, you know, brute force stubbornness just made their way up the hill and blew up the Siegfried line and, you know, held their ground. Uh, the bulge led to somewhat hardening attitudes, being into Germany also. These are the guys who did all that nasty stuff we've been seeing. Uh, we all thought the war was over. I guess the only way to get it over was destroy Germany or soldiers and everybody. Now they never acted on that, but that was a strong feeling. Uh, the closing of the bulge, the main thoughts expressed are ice and mines, ice and mines, perpetually. Uh, I met Sergeant Burroughs. This is a quote he gave to a young fellow who was in, there were no, the guy asked, what were your living conditions during the Battle of Bulge? There were no living conditions. It was survival conditions. Um, he had recently been reassigned from Corps headquarters. He demanded to be transferred to the infantry. He said the clothes I had on the whole month were the clothes I had on when I left Corps headquarters. There are even reports that they used demolitions to start in placements and foxholes. It was that cold. Um, the theme of this is mines and cold weather. In the spring, um, Third Army liberated Ordruf, uh, the first Western concentration camp found, and also the Kaiserode salt mines, which was the first place they found gold supply and stolen art treasures and the like. Um, this was the camp that Ike toured and said, show me everything. I want to see every closet, every attic because someday people are gonna say this didn't happen. And I wanna be able to tell them you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, he, he ordered a representative sample of every unit to tour the camps and he ordered uh, all the local residents 
Um, some of the Germans touring the camp claimed, what are you showing us this? This, we didn't do this, we didn't know. And this was the first expression of collective guilt. The American commander, Colonel Sears of Fourth Armored said, we hold you all responsible. Uh, deploying further south, Nuremberg, the company diarist said, Nuremberg is kaput. The bombers have done a good job of it. They stopped in Nuremberg for a few days. This is a 305th engineer bulldozer clearing the streets. This is their convoy getting ready to go. Um, the last combat operation of the war, Team Smythe, uh, 317th Frank's unit was attached. Um, they were sent to corral a German army. The commander at the last second is having second thoughts. And the commander of Team Smythe says, well, in the morning we're attacking. If you don't surrender, this is one regiment against 25,000. Presumably demoralized, but still uh, Germans. Uh, at the last minute, the German general relented and the attack was called off. Um, the 317th, one of the regiments in the 80th fired the last shot in the European theater of operations. It was, there was a last minute German air assault and they fired at the airplanes. And that was verified. That was the last shot in anger in the ETO. Occupation. Uh, they still have mine clearing and road work, new tasks, uh, building enclosures for POWs and transporting hundreds of thousands of displaced persons. Also building recreational facilities, playing softball, et cetera. Frank was very proud of the fact his platoon had the honor of putting on the 4th of July fireworks show for the division in Kaufbeeren. This was, um, uh, the Winter Olympic Stadium in Garmisch, uh, Bavaria uh, from 1936. This was a Billy Rose show that Frank and many of the boys uh, went to. The epilogue. Uh, Frank um, lived the life that he basically dreamed of through the war. Um, Betty had some last minute second thoughts. Frank had been offered an army career. He had really thrived in the army. He came home on leave and he said, Betty, uh, make up your mind. We get married now or, you know, I'm going to make a career in the army and, you know, we'll see what we see. Betty said, oh, Frank, of course, I'll marry you. Don't be silly. Um, they got married. Um, they had, while he was in training, they had by letter designed their dream house. And in the late forties, they built exactly that house. They raised three children. Uh, Frank joined his father's construction business, was later public works director for the borough of Hawthorne, New Jersey, the town he lived in his whole life. Um, he had thought during the war that photography might become his hobby, but instead it became golf. Um, he was certainly a man of his times. You know, he's the bread. Lois commented while we were working on the project, he was a squad leader and we were his squad. Um, interestingly, he had several dear friends in the army, Scotty and Whitey. Um, and the, the, they got off the ship and they said, it's been good knowing you have a great life. Uh, he did not dwell in the army at all. Um, Frank and Betty's love story continued almost 60 years. Frank passed in January, 2006, um, a few weeks before their 60th anniversary. Um, and of course, this is their wedding. This is their three kids uh, at Daytona. This is Lois, the middle one. And this is Frank and Betty at the golf course. Um, word from our sponsor, this is the book. And with that, um, I'll unshare and I'd welcome any questions.
please, if you have uh, questions, uh, put them in the question and answer icon and I will pass them over uh, to Leon. Uh, I got one question. Uh, how was the TONE of a divisional combat engineer unit different from, say, the course? Did you ever look at that? Uh, the Corps would have had heavier equipment because they're putting in um, permanent bridges, um, masonry bridges, uh, really heavy duty bridges intended to be there. Um, the construction by a divisional engineer, uh, the treadway bridges, which are pontoons and little tank treadways, uh, the Bailey bridges um, and just foot bridges, which are hammer and nail jobs for the most part. Um, obviously a big um, item for the divisional engineers, which wouldn't be a concern for core as perpetual problem of assault boats. Um, the the, um, the uh, S4, for uh, 305th engineers, uh, probably had a future as a novelist. He wrote some of the most interesting after action reports we read, but he'd talk about like at one river crossing, he went off on a scavenger hunt and recovered, you know, 18 boats, which had been lost uh, down the river, but just paddles. Um, the Sour River crossing, one of the things he mentioned was we ferry the infantry across and they throw the paddles on the other side. Uh, and, you know, the guys come back and we've got a boat, but no real way to propel it. Um, that was a constant concern. And then, of course, um, the divisional engineers would be more involved with demolitions because they're at the, the point of the spear um, dealing with... Uh, um, demolishing abatis, um, uh, sometimes um, other obstructions. The Germans excelled at felling trees across the road, um, blowing up mines. Um, uh, they had, uh, I think by late bulge campaign, they, uh, I think it was 10,000 mines that okay. the, the battalion had blown up. This question's from, uh, well, talking about mines. Uh, Ed asked the question, is did he go in detail on mine clearing operations and the type of equipment they use and the methods and casualties from mine clearing operations? Um, surprisingly, the engineer casualties were not that high. Um, I would have expected that they're out in front and the Germans know what they're doing. And so I, I expected to see really high engineering casualties and they, they were not. Um, uh, he constant, both, both Frank and the, uh, the company diary uh, probably wrote more about mine clearing than any other operation, um, but not details. Um, there was, uh, they, there was a, um, they sometimes used bulldozers mm -hmm. and there was a modification of the Sherman tank that had a, a, like a bulldozer blade on the front. But a lot of it sounds like it was just, you know, grit, you know, soldiers finding a minefield and, you know, using American ingenuity to, 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 to find and dig up and disable the mines. What he wrote about was the fun they had piling up huge piles of mines and blowing them up. That's because they, they're young men and they-, they Yeah, like, I mean, they they're 20-year-old men at, away from home with an infinite supply of TNT. They, uh, the 305th um, was given credit for discovering several different new kinds of mines never seen before. 
Uh, one was a modif I remember was a modification of the shoe mine. Um, but yeah, they uh, they found several. They reported several kinds of mines um, to intelligence that 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 had never previously been seen. Question about uh, uh, Patton's army uh, movement up towards Bastogne. Uh, did Patton or did uh, anything in the letters back home indicate that they were concerned about the Germans' knowledge of their movement north? No. Basically, they were doing a flanking movement. No. In fact, um, uh, the standing orders in ETO uh, were to drive in blackout conditions 100% of the time. And Patton for that movement said, scroll, turn the lights on, miles are what matter, you're gonna get to Luxembourg. So he, he told them to drive lights on. So obviously concerns about the Luftwaffe and you know random German soldiers was, was very secondary to the need to make miles. Um, uh, there's no mention uh, in anything I read of, I mean, there was huge resistance in the sense that mines had been laid, trees had been felled, things like that. But I've, I've read no mention of active kinetic okay. German resistance during that movement. This, this question is from Stephen. Uh, the Siegfried line was supposed to be impenetrable. Was that overrated? Because he heard that engineer units used their bulldozer to pile dirt on the concrete teeth and just roll right over them. How did they, how did, uh, was there any descriptions of how they reached the Siegfried line? Yeah. Um, both the Maginot line, which they reached a month or two earlier, and the Siegfried line. Uh, had eroded significantly since the beginning of the war. Uh, obviously, the Maginot line also, the, if there was artillery, it pointed the wrong way. They were still strong points in the sense the soldiers in the emplacements were heavily defended by the emplacements. Um, and it tended to be a, you know, just a sort of a methodical, you know, one obstacle at a time, you rush it, you know, you have uh, demolitions experts, um, they plant the demolitions, you throw in the grenades and they either defend themselves or they come out with their hands up and you move on to the next one. A lot of the armament of the Siegfried line had been removed. It's still a strong point um the the dragon's teeth um were definitely obstacles um the germans did uh put up a fight but um the calculation that ike made that you know it's great they're out in the open we'd rather fight them in the open than have to deal with them behind you know the figfried line um you know, the losses in December and January, you know, we're so Bastogne centric in our study of the bulge. You know, people tend to think the Battle of the Bulge ended late December when Bastogne was liberated. It actually went on another full month in Luxembourg of bitter, brutal slog fighting. Uh, the casualties through that six week campaign were so high that the, the German resistance at the Siegfried line was less than it otherwise would have been because so many of the guys who would have defended the Siegfried line were dead in Luxembourg and Belgium instead. Well, that's all it for questions. Uh, I wanna thank you for uh, relaying this story tonight, relaying this, this uh, personalized history uh, in many respects, but then putting into the larger context. Uh, any closing comments?
Were the Germans aware of patents? Does he go into any detail on mine? Wasn't the Sucre line? Uh, yeah, there, there's actually probably more. The last question from Stephen Smith. Uh, there's probably more detail in the 80th Division's records about the Maginot line um, than the Siegfried line. Uh, not, uh, this is about the dragon's teeth. Yeah, it was really individual units um, just surrounding the pillbox and, you know, using their explosives and their grenades to sort of uh, neutralize the, the people inside. Um, one, um, of course, obviously, this is a proud Allied commander reporting. So perhaps a slight grain of salt, but one, I think, battalion commander, the 80th, uh, reported that a German, um, I think, regiment commander you know, had complimented him on what an effective job his soldiers did of staging assaults on individual strong points. Okay. Um, we're working on a book, which is just about finished on Frank's experience in training and uh, a heavy emphasis in training was put on both mine clearing and assaulting strong points. So these guys, by the time they got to the Siegfried line, they were very proficient, at least for training purposes, at, at doing what they needed to do. Well, I want to thank you for tonight and uh, look forward. Maybe we can have you back to talk about the training program. Uh, prior. To I will tell you, um, it doesn't have patent. It doesn't have Bastogne and the, the sort of the thrilling stuff, but it is such an interesting book. What year uh, was he, what year was, did he enter service? He was drafted in November, 1942. Um, he was sent to the 80th. They had been activated about six months earlier. So they were well into training. He was, they had sent a cadre off to activate the 106th, <laughs> the ill-fated 106th, the last division to deploy to Europe. Well, he and, spent a lot of time in training, so I'm sure. So yeah, they they, they uh, uh, yeah tell. they were in training a year and a half, uh, and they got trained, you know, to the eyeballs. Well, thank you and again. We'd love to come talk about it when. Okay, it's and we look forward to talking again. I'll, I'll give you a call tomorrow. Okay. Okay, thank you. And okay. I thank everybody for their attention. Okay. Good night, everybody. We look forward to seeing you in the near future. Thank you.